Well, welcome to the BMW i5 that I've been living with for the last four months. If you don't follow me on Instagram, if you don't listen to my podcast, that may come as a bit of a surprise to you because I haven't really talked about this car here on the main channel. There's a reason for that. This is the first time I've given it a real go at living with a proper EV. And I wanted to bide my time, figure out the ins and outs, the, the pros and cons, before then summing up the whole experience for all of you. Truth be told though, I was supposed to have this car for six months. However, apparently there's been some kind of recall on the i5. Because this thing was very kindly lent to me by BMW UK, they can't really mess around with recalls. So I literally got an email from them like two days ago saying, really sorry, but we need the car back at the end of the week. So this is my last day with the car, my only opportunity to film a kind of holistic review. And we've got a lot to get through. This is gonna be an information heavy video because the last four months well, haven't really gone anything like I expected them to. So yeah, hello one and all, welcome to Seen Through Glass. Welcome to my review of living with a BMW i5 slash an EV for the last four months. <laughs> So I guess first things first, why an i5? Well, I think lots of you know, I'm a fan of modern day BMWs. Prior to this, I owned two X3s, uh, first off an M40i and then an M40d. And actually that's where the kind of idea for, for going electric first came from. Because I thought, you know what would be interesting is to now jump into an iX3, see how the electric version compares to the petrol and diesel ones. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized, well, that's a car I share with my wife and it doesn't feel entirely fair to kind of force her to have to figure out how to run an electric car just because I want to do so from a research slash content point of view. So I thought, you know what, safer, leave her in a combustion engine vehicle that she knows and is familiar with, whilst I figure out whether we can replace the family car with an electric version in the future. I wanted to stick with BMW because, well, I'm so familiar with these products, meaning I can really focus on, on the electric element rather than tech that maybe is just from the manufacturer, if that makes sense. Uh, so I got in touch with BMW UK, told them what I was thinking, and it was just at the same time that they were getting i5s on their fleets. They said, look, this is the, this is the latest and greatest electric car from us, so we'd love to get you in one if that feels appropriate. And I was like, yeah, sounds blooming lovely. Now, I'm sure some of you have noticed that this is the M60 variant of the i5, essentially the big Larry one. We've got like 600 horsepower, it does 0 to 60 in like 3.8 seconds, despite weighing 2.2 tons. I think the price is tested is like 112 grand, so we're at the top end of the EV market. If I was spending my own money, is this the version I would have got? Probably not, because, well, I don't really feel like I need performance from an electric vehicle, as I was just hinting at, I'm doing this research to see if our family car could one day become an EV. I'm super spoiled. I've got the GT3 and the Challenger Dali if I want to go and have some fast fun. I want something that can just, well, munch motorway miles and be used for the mundane daily commute. Not that I really have a daily commute. My life is far too unpredictable, but you, you get the idea. And the thing is, when you look at these kind of performance variants of EVs, often the range is impacted to get maximum performance. Yeah, the range just can't be as good as the less powerful versions. But I think for the i5, this M60 version has a range that's like 40 or 50 miles less than the less powerful variants. I don't know what that means in real world, but it's just meant that during this loan, I've had to remind myself whenever I've looked at the range and felt a little bit disappointed, there is a more efficient version out there. So if you're like me and you're not looking to throw your big, comfortable, lovely, executive electric saloon car around a tight and twisty track or road, yeah, maybe the M60 is not the one for you. Problem is, <laughs> it looks better and it's kind of better equipped. So it's always going to be slightly more desirable. But yeah, this is, this is my first conundrum with electric cars. The ones I want are the kind of sporty ones, but then they're inherently less efficient. And I would want an efficient EV. So yep, there's your first juxtaposition. I hope I used that word rightly. Let's get into some driving impressions. I'm filming today in London. Uh, multiple reasons for that. Uh, firstly, sadly, I just haven't got time to head out of town. As I mentioned, the car goes back tomorrow. I only found that out a few days ago, and this is the only window of time I've got to film anything. So yeah, we're staying close to home. But that's good because this is really where I've used the car 
most of the time over the last four months. I've done like three and a half thousand miles and a lot of that has been motorway miles. Some of it's been kind of country back roads but the majority of it has been in and around town. And for me, that's where EVs still make the most sense. Um, the easiest way for me to sum up my time behind the wheel of this car, say it's, it's been lovely. Well, that's not a particularly descriptive or, well, it's a bit of a lazy way to describe the experience, I suppose, but it's the easiest way to do so. It's just all, it's just all really good. Like, you know, the car hasn't really done anything wrong. It's everything I would want and expect from a big executive saloon car. I mean, it, it feels big, it is massive. It's got this really aggressive rear wheel steer that in town every now and again can make you feel a tad nauseous because it just turns quicker and sharper than you would expect or want. But it's fairly easy to park and maneuver because of it. Visibility is good, the ride is very comfortable, it's super quiet. On the motorway, it just powers along. It's got this assisted driving system, which actually I can utilize now because it allows me to crawl in traffic, stops and starts itself, it even steers itself every now and again. Oh, there seems to be a big queue of young ladies waiting. I think they're going to some kind of shop. Anyway, let's not get distracted. Easy to get distracted because there's not a lot going on. The car's just, just getting on with it, doing its job, which as I say, is, is lovely. It's just nice. It's just, yeah. I think the reason why I sort of default to that word is because maybe it's also a tad unmemorable. A little bit bland. It's just like it's like really good, but not necessarily like exhilarating in any way, despite all that power. Which again, I'm gonna say just feels unnecessary. I know I said that I didn't really want it in the first place, but yeah, it, you're just so aware that, that, that there's so much power, instant power, underneath your right foot that you spend your whole life just just feathering the throttle. You've got to be so gentle and careful with it because if you if you hammer it by mistake at any point, you will end up in a tree or a bus or the back of the car in front of you. It's even pulling on the motorway. I'm like, wow, I don't need it. I feel not. I'm like, because it's just so nausea inducing. Now, part of its its blandness will be the lack of combustion engine emotion. So, like so many electric cars, BMW have tried to kind of put in some gimmicky emotion. So for example, I'm sure you've seen it. If I go into my driving modes, hit expressive. These are sounds designed by the famous composer Hans Zimmer. And as I accelerate, it adds a sort of Tron-like soundtrack. When I first experienced it, I was like, that's amazing. And everyone who got in the car was like, listen to this. After about 45 seconds, I'm like, hey, psh, psh. <laughs> It's just like with the Abarth 500E that I test drove. Like initially, some of the things you're like, ah, oh, this is cool. And then after a while, you're like, just turn it, turn it all off. Really, that's where this car's at its best. Just turn off all the gimmicks and just use it as a car. And and then it's it's lovely. So yeah, BMW fanatics, people out there looking for the best five series ever made. You may be a little disappointed, but people just looking for a very good big saloon car. There's really not much to complain about in this thing. I don't think only thing is I can't confidently say that would be the same when you start pushing on in this car just because I've done so little of that the first time I ever drove an i5 M60 was actually prior to this specific loan and I did go and thrash it around some country lanes and I was super impressed for me it kind of felt similar to a Porsche Taycan it, it felt sort of dynamic I mean still big and heavy but yeah I liked it but I've just literally never done it again I don't think I've ever gone into sport mode in this particular car I've never pulled this boost paddle, which is ridiculous. If you pull the boost paddle, which is like a, a gear shift paddle on the steering wheel, well, it goes into like this kind of hyperdrive mode that's just bizarre and wild and, and, you know, something to show off to your friends, but I don't think it's something you're ever going to use unless you have to overtake like six cars in a 200 meter distance. So yeah, it, if you're looking for a review of the performance dynamics of this car and how it handles and feels at speed, probably go watch a different video because, yeah, I just I can't really tell you. I think it's all right. Now, if I described the driving experience of this car as being, as being lovely and solid and good, but potentially a little unmemorable and bland, 
I might have to say the same thing about the interior. Now, now bear with me here, because I'm probably going to contradict myself a few times. As I mentioned, I'm a fan of new BMWs, and I actually love the BMW infotainment system. I think it's one of the best on the market, super easy to navigate and utilize. Even the BMW app is really good and actually works. It's still just, yay. And that's what we've got here. We've got the latest BMW infotainment system. It has gesture control, meaning I can turn the volume up and down by doing that. I, I purposely didn't put my hand in the right place just then because I don't actually want the music to come on. But it, it all is functional and works. And that's a big win, isn't it? Well, I worry by kind of standing still and, and putting in the sort of, you know, the, the current lineup of products, BMW actually took a step backwards. And let me explain why. Uh, last year, I think, or maybe 18 months or so ago, spent a week with the Mercedes EQS AMG. Now, of course, that's more of a 7 Series rival, but the EQS and the EQE, which would be a 5 Series rival, are similar. And that car inside just felt, felt futuristic, felt forward-thinking, it was premium, it was exciting, and I was like, this is amazing, what a cool place to spend time. On top of that, uh, then the last year, Spent a long weekend with the new Porsche Cayenne Hybrid, and that car had so much tech on it that kind of blew me away. The headlights were lighting up the road in a way I'd never seen before. The wireless phone charger charged my phone in seconds, and the phone never got hot. If I put my phone the charger in here, after about 10 minutes, it's on fire. But there was so much else on that Cayenne that I was like, whoa! The interior, the tech, the, the user features of this car have never really made me gone, whoa. They've made me gone be like, because mm -hmm, there are a few gimmicks. Remember the sound I showed you earlier? Well, check out this. You can take a selfie in this car. I mean, God, God knows why, but, but that, that's a feature. I mean, I think there's a security reason via the app. When you're not with the car, you can check the interior. Cool, but I mean, I just wish instead of things like that, BMW found some ways to, well, change it up. Now, I suspect the reason they didn't do that was firstly for product familiarity, so that if you are new to the EV world, you step into here and you go, okay, oh, it's a BMW, it's not that different, it's fine, phew! But also, and this I think we have to applaud BMW for doing, they're offering this car with multiple powertrains. Yes, this is the i5, but you can get a, a 5 Series with a petrol engine, a 5 Series with a plug-in hybrid variant, and, and that means you've got variety, but compromise. For example, in this electric only version, I don't think we need this big central tunnel that could go and open up the space and it would feel different. But no, they've kept it there because if you had a petrol version, you'd need it. So yeah, it, it just means that it, it's good, it's solid, just like the driving experience, but a little bit like, hmm, maybe they could have done more to make it feel a bit more special, but that could just be my expectations being too high. My expectations are always fairly high. But I just feel like they're making such a big deal about this car, and then you step into it, and it doesn't feel as advanced as maybe the adverts, the press materials, the salesman spiel suggests. Well, now the car is plugged in and charging, it feels like the right moment to get into kind of the chunky part of this video, the nitty gritty of what it's been like to live with this electric i5. Forget driving impressions and my impressions of the interior. What's this thing been like on a day-to-day -day basis? Has it suited my lifestyle? I think let's kick things off with range. I believe the quoted range figures for the M60 version of the i5, it's like 315 miles. Mm. <laughs> Important to note, this loan has taken place during the British winter. And famously, EVs don't perform as well in the colder months as they do in the warmer months. But still, I think the first six weeks I had this car, the like maximum estimated range I saw was like 215 miles from a 100% charge. <laughs> and it seemed to deplete very quickly. Okay, fair enough, it was cold, but that was, that was tough. I came into this loan with a completely open mind. I didn't want to have any kind of prior assumption. I was just like, I'm going to just use the car and see how I get on. But I was like, this is not fun. <laughs> but with time, that has improved. And now we're in slightly warmer months. I think 100% charge would give me like 245 mile estimated range. So nowhere near 300, but, but it's, pretty, it's pretty accurate. 
think a full days of dri full day of driving I'd get back like 10 or 15 miles below that estimate so you can rely on it pretty well uh, charging <laughs> now I really only considered maybe getting an EV or at least researching what an EV would be like to live with because I finally had a charging point at home when I moved into a new property. It was installed by the developer of the property so I didn't have much choice on what kind of charger it was etc but I at least knew that yes I could get an EV and charge it at home not have to rely on the public charging network because the last time I spent any considerable time with an EV I did have to use the public charging network and it was a disaster. The chargers never worked, there were endless queues, they were slow, it was just a nightmare. Funny thing is though, I've ended up using the public network more than I've used my home charger for this car. I think a few different reasons for that. Firstly, let's not forget, this is a super high powered, high performance battery capable of fast charging. And my home charging point isn't a fast charger. In fact, to charge this car from like 20% to 80% takes about 13 or 14 hours. Not great, because after a long day of filming, I was getting home at like 7 p.m., plugging the car into charge, needing to leave at 6 a.m. the next day, and I'd still be at like 65% charge. And that was becoming a hassle. So I thought, you know what, let's, let's find some fast chargers nearby. And I started to explore the area and had a very positive experience. In fact, in the four months I've had this car, I've had zero negative public charging experiences. Okay, a lot of my charging has been done in and around London, but I've used the motorway network a lot and done some remote charging. And every time I've walked up to a public charger, I've just tapped my card, plugged it in and off I go. These MFG fast chargers, not sponsored, but could be, uh, seem to be the best, or they're at least my favorite. I seek them out. Always give me like a charge of like 105 or 110 kilowatts. Always seem to work, always seem to be free and available. And yeah, the charge, well, the car charges pretty quickly. Actually, I've got some stats here. Look at me, what a professional. I found out, or I worked out, thanks to the BMW app, that during the last four months, three and a half thousand miles I've covered in this thing, I've used public chargers 18 times. And on average, I've charged for 31 minutes. I think that's pretty good. A lot of my concerns about living with an EV that I'd spend hours sitting at charging points. The minute I leave home, I'm usually up against it timing wise. My days are just packed as all of our days are. And I just didn't want to have to sit charging endlessly. But actually, that's not what's happened. But when I saw that stat, I was like, well, that kind of makes sense because the charging experience with this car has been very positive. I've plugged it in, off I go. I go in and get a coffee. I do some emails. Maybe I upload a podcast, do a little bit of editing or plan the next part of my day. And then I'm like, cool, I've got enough. And actually, that's come with time because I've also learned you don't always have to hit that maximum charge. Just like when you're filling up a car, you don't always have to do a full tank. You can do the 20 or 30%. When I first got this thing, every charge, I was like, I've got to get to 80% or 90 or 100. But then with time, as I say, you can just do those top ups. And because the range is fairly accurate, I knew, okay, I could just add 50 miles, off I go. It's meant I've had the confidence to do some big and long journeys in this thing, which I think is good. But it has been expensive because I've been using this public network. I worked out I've probably spent around £550 on electricity during my time with this car. That would have been heavily reduced if I'd used the home charger more. But because I'm often doing these back-to-back -back days of big, long journeys with not a lot of time in between, I've, I've needed the fast charging network. So I've just chosen to use it. And actually, comparatively, even though it's a lot, still a lot less than, well, a combustion engine version of this car. And let's just pick up on that. I think I mentioned earlier, on paper, performance-wise, cost-wise, a lot of elements, this thing is very similar to the, to the old or the outgoing M5, M5 competition. So I thought I'd dial into that a bit more. So let's pretend I'd bought both cars at the same time because they cost a very similar amount let's say 112 113,000 pounds you'd probably get a tiny few tiny bit less options on the M5 more realistically it's 118 grand with all the lovely options this car gets but let's let, let, we're overcomplicating things 115 grand for both cars start off with insurance to insure this 
i5, cheapest quote I could find online, £1,429. For the M5, cheapest quote, £2,264. So I'm already behind on the M5. Then we get into charging, as I've just outlined, 550 quid to charge this i5, mainly on public charges for the 3,500 miles. The M5, I worked out, would probably be about £800 in fuel. So let's face it, you're going to do 25 to 27 mpg in an M5. It's probably going to give you a tank range of 350 miles. So then 10 refuels, maybe 75 or 80 quid each. So yeah, 800 quid on fuel. So more expensive to insure, more expensive to fuel. So then we get into, well, okay, we're four months on. I want to get out. Let's forget the recall and pretend like I just wanted to sell up. Now, this is where it's sort of a little bit mm, hard to understand and read. Based on auto trader values, it's a very similar amount of depreciation. Uh, 2023 i5 M60 with 3,500 miles currently being advertised for like 88,000 pounds. A 2023 M5 with 3,500 miles currently being advertised for around 85,000 pounds. So similar levels. It doesn't tell the true story because advertised values aren't true values. So I thought I'd go and we buy any car, which is <laughs> never a good way to determine the value of your car because, well, they kick you in the cojones. But I was just interested. And yeah, it's where the positivity for the i5 stops because, well, we buy any car offered me 41 grand for this car, 65 and a half grand for the M5. I did call up a friendly BMW dealer and also called Tony at Gravelwood to kind of understand why that would be that way and if those values were appropriate or, or accurate. They both said no, that's we buying a car being cheeky, but electric cars will always have a much bigger margin in them because still to this day, I think 80% plus electric car buyers are business owners and they take advantage, they get tax benefits, but only if they buy new EVs. So these big, expensive, fancy EVs go to business owners because they're tax write-offs, but it means that the used examples aren't attractive because you don't get the same benefits. So they tend to sit on the forecourt for a long time with no one snapping them up because at 85 grand, it's still, well, it's still a lot of money, isn't it? And usually financing wise, they're quite expensive because of those residual values. So if I wanted to sell this car and go to someone like Tony or a BMW dealer, they would be hesitant and they would probably offer me a very low price. So the depreciation is still a, a bit of a hammer point. And actually it burst my bubble slightly because as I say, the charging experience has been largely positive. Yes, the range is far lower than claimed, but that's okay. I would say it has been easy enough to live with. There's been a couple of journeys where I've been hesitant to take the car because I didn't want the hassle of having to charge and being worried about range and things like that. I've been up against it timing wise, but as I keep saying, look back on it, the time isn't that bad. But if I was to actually sit there and think, well, would I go out and buy it? There's just that nervousness, that, that lack of confidence in the, well, what happens when I want to get out of it? And that remains the problem, at least at this high end of the market. Maybe the answer is, look at the more affordable EVs. They've got less money to lose. But still then, there are those sort of hidden costs and hidden issues that people don't always explain about used cars, battery depletion, all these kind of different things. Still a lot to figure out in this world, but I'm going to sum up here. This has been a really positive experience, so much so that I'm genuinely sitting here going, how could I get an EV and protect myself? What are my options? Could I buy a super depreciated Taycan? Is that a route to go? Or could I look at a smaller, smaller range EV, but then I'm screwed because I've got the longer journey. So there's a lot of things to juggle, but that's how good this experience has been. And I think a lot of that has been down to public charging network, not just this car, but the way this car can charge, the speed it can charge, the way it ret retains that charge has been good. So yeah, big old ramble at the end. I hope I've presented those facts and stats correctly and given you some food for thought. I'm sorry this video has been so relatively rushed and it hasn't been exactly the review that I've planned, but I'm very grateful to BMW for giving me this chance and opportunity. And it has changed my mindset about EVs quite a lot. And as soon as we can figure out this value, this demand, this residual, this depreciation part, suddenly we're getting into a, a place where things start to make sense. Yeah, anyway. Subscribe now, stay tuned, plenty more content to come, and heck, maybe some more EV content on the way.